Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our 2021 lecture series. Um, this is the second lecture in our lecture series entitled Fighting for Souls, Spirituality, and Religion in Barbados. This evening, we are joined by Dr. Carl Watson, and our lecture will be chaired by Sir Paul Altman. Um, just a few reminders of our housekeeping rules. So all comments and conversations must be placed in the chat. Um, after Dr. Watson's lecture, any questions you have for him should be placed in the question and answer feature below. Um, for those of us joining on Facebook, you can always send the questions via the comments and they will be relayed to Dr. Watson. Um, and as a courtesy, all participants will be muted. So now I'm going to hand you over to Sir Paul Altman, who will introduce Dr. Watson. So, Sir Paul. Thank you, Elena. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Watson, but before I do that, I would like to just uh, have, make a few comments and, and welcome those uh, that are participating this afternoon, the audience, and uh, certainly we appreciate their support. As you said, this is the second lecture in a series that the museum is presenting. And we should acknowledge our sponsors and, uh, and, and show our appreciation for their support. And these are, of course, the, the, this uh, lecture series 2021 is hosted by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the University of the West Indies Department of History and Philosophy. Um, it now uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson formerly served uh, as a senior lecturer in history at the University of the West Indies. He spent 32 years. So you can see that uh, I could uh, spend the entire lecture time describing all of his contributions, but let me stick to some main points and say that in his 32 years at the university, he was in the Department of History at Mona, Jamaica, and at Cave Hill in Barbados. And he was educated at Harrison College, the University of the West Indies, and the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida. Carl worked in the Barbados Foreign Service in the decade of the 1970s, serving in Venezuela and Brazil, where he was Councillor Chargé d'Affaires, and in Germany as Council General. He serves as the Deputy Chairman of the Bush Hill Tourism Trust, Inc., and Chairman of the Barbados Carolinas Committee. And he is the Editor Emeritus of the Journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, having served as editor for over 20 years. Dr. Watson has authored a number of books including Barbados, The Civilized Island, Old Doll, Matriarch of Newton Plantation, Barbados First, and a pictorial history from 1900 to 1970. One other uh, publication is, was uh, Not for Wages Alone. Dr. Watson is one of four authors of the 50th anniversary celebratory history of the Barbados National Trust. Together with Howard Johnson, he co-edited White Minorities of the Caribbean. He has also published several essays in various academic journals and has chapters in a number of scholarly works. He has published four articles about Sephardic Jews in the Journal of the Barbados Museum Historical Society and wrote chapter 11 of the volume, The Jews in the Caribbean 2013, edited by Jane Gerber. I should add that I've known Carl since our early school days and must acknowledge his significant contribution through his research gathering information used in the restoration of our 1654 synagogue and its museum, its graveyard, and its mikvah or ritual bath. Dr. Watson's topic this afternoon 
Judaism and Barbados from the 17th century. I am sure will provide important details on the Jewish presence in Barbados from its earliest settlement and, the, and their contribution to this island. I now offer Carl Watson, Dr. Carl Watson to uh, give his lecture. Thank you, Paul. Welcome everyone. I have a confession to make. First of all, contrary to what most people think, I'm not Jewish. Although Paul, so Paul has claimed that I am an honorary member of the community because of the work I've done over the many years. And a lot of people ask me why. And quite simply, it's all due to my great aunt, Lily Atkins. When I was a youngster of five and six years old, Aunt Lil, as we all called her, would walk me through Bridgetown and point out houses that she knew that had been inhabited when she was a girl by widows, elderly widows of or relics of the Sephardic families who had largely disappeared from Barbados. So she would also take me into the graveyard of the synagogue, Nita Israel, which was then the offices of a number of agencies, including the Barbados Turf Club. And she'd point out various graves and say, oh, I knew, I knew the Valverde family and I knew who the Lindos were and so on. And that necessitated my interest. Now, I haven't established my interests. I just want to establish some of the sources that are available for anybody interested in the fascinating history of the Sephardic community of Barbados, and then subsequently the, the more recent Ashkenazim community. And I don't want to surprise everyone now, but actually I'm going to cover a bit more than the 17th century today, and when I will end with a few comments on the Ashkenazim community as well. But yes, the first and richest source material for the Sephardic community are the records of the Sephardim themselves. And these are housed not in Barbados when the synagogue and everything pertaining to the synagogue was sold, all the records were sent to the parent synagogue in London, Bethes Marks, and they've now been deposited at the London, London Metropolitan Archives, where I've been on a number of occasions to study them carefully. And these are the daily account books of the Sephardic community, the letter books and the minute books of the committee set up to oversee the affairs of the Sephardic community. And this is called the, the Mahamad or the Junta of Elders who had been, I got a sign saying my battery is running low. Not my battery, the computer's battery <laughs> is running low. But Elena is here waiting steadfastly on hand to solve any problem that might come up because I'm a creature of the 18th century. I'm a neophyte where computer technology, et cetera, is concerned. So she's busting about. Anya, Eureka, that little window that says battery running low has gone and we're gung ho, green light again, all ready to go. Apart from the records of Nita Israel themselves, they are also, of course, government records birth and death records, wills, very important. I have a huge collection, huge volume that my graduate students very kindly did for me, transcribing all the extant Sephardic wills that are here in our local archives, combined with other wills that I've, I've got 
from the UK. The will is a very important source for any historian delving into the past. Also, of course, and this may seem a bit strange and perhaps a bit macabre to people, but graveyards, tombstones, are like documents that can be read by historians trained to read them. So, in fact, in some of the slides that I will show later, you will see some of the fascinating tombstones that can be found in the graveyard of Nidhe Israel. And then, of course, finally, but by no means last, archaeology. Because where documentary evidence is lacking, archaeology can fill that vacuum and can supply us with perhaps a more democratic way of looking at history. Because very often, documents reflect the powerful. Documents reflect the mindset of those who created them the official mindset, the elites who could pay to have documents done about them, etc. Whereas archaeology, the archaeology is literally the retrieval, cataloging and analysis of what people discarded in the past, the garbage of the past, the debris, detritus of the past. And everybody who has existed at any point in time has been a consumer. And when you consume what you don't need or what you get tired of, or what, got, what gets to all the broken, et cetera, you discard. And so that is the nitty gritty of the archeologist who recovers all this material, et cetera, and then interprets it. Now, for those of you who are non-Jewish, let me establish a bit of context because it's important to locate the old Sephardic community of Barbados in a general global world picture. I would first of all want to say that when I, as a non-Jew, look back at the history of the Jewish people, there are, there are two things, one good and one bad, that leap out at me. If I were to characterize in a few words, the strong points, the glue that binds the Jewish people together, it would be a sense of community, a sense of belonging. You know, the Sephardim call themselves la nation, the nation, with all that it implies for a sense of togetherness, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. And Within that, that community sense that I've, I've just mentioned is also the, the way, the, the, the rules of Jewish life bound up in one word, halachic. What is halachic? What is prescribed by the Torah and what is prescribed by the writings of rabbis over the ages a well-known rabbi such as Mama Maynids for the Sephardim, and their distillation of certain truths, certain rituals, certain laws that are all embedded in this, in this composite pathway that Jews are expected to follow. The, what is right and what is wrong? What is halachic? Now, Judaism itself is divided into two main streams, the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. Very broadly speaking, the Sephardim are the people of the sun, the people of the Circum Mediterranean, the people of North Africa, Iberia, or the Middle East, but with their stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula, in Spain in particular. These are the people of Sepharad, as the, as the Torah, the, the Old Testament, as Christians would say, identifies Sepharad as the, the home of the dispersed Sephardim after the fall of Babylonia, after the, the Roman captivities, etc. The Sephardim 
were in Spain from the times of the Romans. They were in Spain from the times of the Almorava dynasties. They were in Spain during the times of the invasions from North Africa into Spain. They were in Spain during the whole period of the Reconquista. When Christian forces crossed the Pyrenees after the famous battle of Roncesvalles, when that stopped Islamic penetration in the Western Europe and marked the gradual retreat of Islam in Spain. Only in 1492, Granada was conquered. And that put an end to the Moorish occupation settlement of Spain for almost a millennia. Now, during that time period, the Sephardim were valued members of the communities of Spain and Portugal. They were courtiers, they were educated people, they were civil servants, they were intellectuals, they were philosophers, they were doctors. They played an inordinately large role in Spanish life, both in Muslim Spain and in Christian Spain. But yet in 1492, the very year that Columbus sailed across the Atlantic to quote unquote, discover the new world, a place occupied by millions of people who had been there since the Wisconsin glaciation of 15 to 20,000 years ago. Nevertheless, um, 1492 was a milestone in world history, not because of Columbus, but because of the biological consequences that the bridging of the Atlantic Ocean resulted in once that wall that was the Atlantic Ocean had been broken down and people could transit to and from the old world to the new world, bringing with them innumerable things from diseases, from bacteria and viruses, right up to, to humans. There was a, a highway after 1492. But 1492 also resulted in something of great tragedy for the Sephardim. And this brings me to the other point I wanted to make. The other point that I, person as an outsider, have observed of Jewish communities over time. And this is the bad aspect to Judaism or, or, or what Judaism has incurred, the penalty that Judaism has incurred, the twin penalties of discrimination and persecution, horrific persecution. So let's look at the Sephardim in Spain. Once that edict of expulsion was issued against them, what choice did they have? They either converted and became what became known as Nuevo Cristianos, New Christians, or they stayed and they professed their faith in the face of the rage in Spanish Inquisition, the most terrible on the Torquemala of all of the Inquisitions scattered throughout Europe, and suffer the ultimate fate. Thousands perished, tied to a stake, and burnt for professing their faith in what was called, ironically, an act of faith, an auto da fe. And so the ultimate choice was to escape, escape the beloved Spain, escape Al Andalus, and go to the Orient, the Middle East, where Islamic caliphates and communities were very welcoming to these train, trained, skilled peoples migrating to the port cities of Europe, and more importantly, for what happens with ultimately with Barbados, at a juncture, an early juncture in Spanish history, after the Spanish monarchy had been consolidated and Spain emerged out of that ethos of a number of small kingdoms. Before, before the Isabel and Ferdinand, Spain was divided into a number of small kingdoms. Ferdinand and Isabella brought everything together. And of course, a man like Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, inherited through the Habsburg line, a huge empire that spanned much of Western Europe. And that included Holland. But the Dutch didn't 
didn't want to remain under the Spanish yoke. And because Holland had moved away from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism, they engaged in a war of attrition against Spain for their independence. And so they were welcoming to thousands of Sephardic families who left Spain and established themselves in Amsterdam and then from there in other European port cities. This is one thing, one, one hallmark of the Sephardim that I would wish to underscore. These are people who understand trade, who understand family networks, who understand networking, and who understand the logistics of commerce. So back to Holland and ultimately how it affects Barbados. As part of their attack against the Spanish Empire, Spain by this time, remember, has swallowed Portugal and absorbed the Portuguese Empire as well. So that means that Spain controls all of the Americas, including the old Portuguese colony of Brazil. So the Dutch attack the weakest part of Brazil, the northeastern part of Brazil, which is a sugar producing part of Brazil, and they conquer that, that portion of northeastern Brazil, what is today largely Bahia, dominated by the port city of Recife. And many Sephardim go and settle there. They're there for a short period of time, a little over 20 years. And in that time span from settlement between the late 1620s and 1654, when they're ultimately expelled from Brazil, they acquire a considerable working knowledge of the technological aspects, the planting aspects. Sugar requires land, labor, and capital. And the Sephardim were important conduits and catalysts for the growth of the sugar industry in Brazil. With the collapse of the Dutch hold on Brazil and the reinstallation of Roman Catholicism in that section of Brazil and the advent of the Inquisition, the Sephardim then were faced with the same issues that I had faced in 1492 in Spain. Convert, become a Roman Catholic, be tried at an auto de fe and be killed or, or flee. And many of them went back to Amsterdam and others petitioned Oliver Cromwell for permission to settle in Barbados. And that is the genesis of the port of the Sephardic community in Barbados. I'll, before I expand then on the arrival, let me just go back. I mentioned the, the Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim are people of the snow. They're people of Western and Central Europe going right across to Russia. They are people of town and countryside. In terms of numbers, they're far more numerous in today's numerical demographic patterns, cultural patterns of the total world Jewish population, Ashkenazim account for about 80%, Sephardim account for about 20%. They're differentiated as well in areas like language. The Sephardim speak a form of Spanish called Ladino. The Ashkenazim speak a form of German called Yiddish. They differ in terms of cuisine, music. Oh, there's nothing more beautiful than Sephardic music. And for those of you out there listening to me, if you want to hear a good proponent of Sephardic music, jot this name down, Ofra Haza, O-F-R-A-H-A-Z-A, -A, a Sephardic Yemenite descended singer. She's dead now, but she sings beautifully. There, there's nothing as moving as listening to her sing Kaddish. 
go to YouTube, listen to her sing Kaddish, and you'll understand what I mean about the, the beauty of, of Sephardic music. Doesn't mean that the Ashkenazim haven't got good music as well, but I'm partial to Sephardic music. I quote um, two Sephardic historians who did a study of Sephardic Jewry, Ben Basso and Rodriguez. And I, I quote from them. They talking about the year 1492 say, 1492 represents a major turning point in the history of the Jewish people. So 1492, bear that in mind, the Jewish world changed once again. So we move then to Barbados. Now, the Jewish connection with Barbados goes back a long way. The first record we have of Jews being present in Barbados are in 1628. But I have a good friend, Ida Schroeder, a Dutch historian, who's done a lot of work in the Dutch notarial records in Amsterdam. And she's come up with a large body of evidence to show the immense trade that occurred between Holland and Barbados in the first three decades of settlement. Remember, bear this in mind, Barbados might very well have foundered as an English colony, were it not for the interaction of Dutch and Sephardic Dutch merchants in sustaining that trade and in sustaining the viability of the early English settlement of Barbados. In fact, in 1651, when Cromwell sent that fleet out on the ASQ to invade Barbados, remember that's the point in time when Barbados has declared itself independent of the English Commonwealth. They want nothing to do with England. They have declared Barbados an independent country and Cromwell decides he's not going to lose the jewel in, in the English trading scheme and the English crown. He sends a fleet and an army out to besiege and retake Barbados. And what does that ask you do when he sails into Carlisle Bay in 1651? He sees a fleet of 14 Dutch merchant ships. And you can bet that there are Sephardic merchants on board those Dutch merchant ships. And he seizes them all as prizes of war. What Cromwell also does is he institutes the first of the navigation acts, which penalizes Barbados because it says that Barbados and other English colonies in the New World must trade only with England, must ever England has to be a conduit conduit for all exports, etc. Mother countries set up colonies to benefit the mother countries. Barbados, on the other hand, acting in its own interests, and this is one of the things that prompted Barbados to tell Cromwell, we're declaring war against you, we're declaring independence, we want nothing to do with the Commonwealth of England, we want to be an independent island by ourselves. Barbados wanted the right to have free trade for itself to continue trading with the Dutch. As I said, the English weren't prepared to allow this and their superior naval and armed forces smashed Barbados. So to that came the 1652 Charter Barbados where Barbados surrendered, but retained its internal legislative system and never ever became a crown colony, all deriving from these incidents of the early 1650s. So at this point in time, bear in mind that the doors of England are closed to Jews. If you remember your Ivanhoe and the expulsion of Jews from England in the 14th century on the Edward, Jews fled, had to flee England or suffer considerable persecution in the huge horrible massacre at York 
all of these things Jews experienced in England until the doors were closed against them. As an experiment, Cromwell opened up Barbados to Jewish settlement. And this is where then the initial Sephardic community of Barbados became rooted in Barbados. The very first thing that the Jews who arrived here between 1649, 1654, more or less, there are no precise dates. The very first thing that the, the Jewish community of Bridgetown did once their numbers were sufficient was to find a spot of land close to the core of Bridgetown where the essential ingredients of Jewish community life could be set up. The very first thing to be set in place was a mikvah, or as the Sephardim called, they didn't use the term mikvah, they used the term banyo. In nearly 200 years of minutes that I've examined, I've never once seen the term mikvah used. It's always been banyo. And I have here, um, Elena is going to help me with this. She is going to show us some photographs of various aspects of the, of the synagogue plot, etc. So we look at the mikvah, the very first one. Um, yeah, there it is, yes. So here is the splendid mikvah. I, I have to tell you some about this because my students and I, and my field director, Michael Stoner, we, we excavated a parking lot and we came up with this. The earliest known mikvah or ritual bath in the entire Americas. When we excavated down to floor level and at both corners, the spring water started to flow and it filled up to the ritual level. You can see where the water level is there by looking at the, the dark, dark line of the, of the bricks at the back. That's where the, the depth of the water is. But as it started to, to fill, I mean, it was like a, a spiritual moment. It, it, it was an epiphany of some sort for me. Here was this thing that had been filled in for about 150 years, never been used. We clean it out and like magic, like somebody turned on the faucets and the spring, see it had to be built over a living spring, a flowing spring it started to flow again. So, so there you have it. And the, the following slide, Elena, is the steps going down to this um, ritual bath or mikvah. It is used not exclusively by, but primarily by women, both prior as a ritual requirement prior to marriage and as a cleansing requirement after each menstrual cycle. Now this, judging from the ceramics that we recovered from it, was, these are old ceramics, many dating from the middle of the 17th century that confirm the date of construction of the mikvah. So the mikvah was almost certainly constructed somewhere around 1653, 1654 in that time period. After that, of course, the synagogue was built. And here's a photograph of the old synagogue restored after the 1831 hurricane and its interior, which to some degree echoes what the early Sephardi would have known from their first parent synagogue, which was the synagogue in Amsterdam. The English synagogue by the Smarks became the, the subsequent um, parent synagogue, the reader's desk, etc. All of this um, restored. So here we have the, the built aspect of the, 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 the Nidhe Israel, the scattered of Israel 
synagogue for the Kal, the community of Nita Israel. And then the other third most important thing for people of the Jewish faith, the graveyards. This is a modern day synagogue today. And the women's entrance, the back it being an Orthodox community where women worshiped on the top floor and men on the bottom. And then on to the, the graveyard, which we shall see here. And these are aspects of the iconography of the early, early Sephardic tombs. The most frequently encountered icon is that hand. It's the hand of God emerging from the clouds, severing the tree of life, denoting that this person's life has come to an end. As I said, I've done a complete study and published a study of the iconography of the graves in the, in the Sephardic graveyard, and these are fascinating. And we'll look quickly at some of them. Elena can go through them, and we can all have a look and share. You can see, again, here an aspect of Judaism, Hebrew, Portuguese, Ladino, and let's see the initials, S-B-A-G-D-E-G, so bendita alma gosed eternal gloria, his beloved soul shall enjoy eternal glory. And I think, as I said, the hand cut in the, the tree of life. And a poem there. Often you get these poems, beautiful short poems written in Ladino, celebrating, or, or some of them are love poems, some of them. This one, if I can translate it for you, um, it, it talks about the, the age of the, the person, um, that, that young age, cut down in death, killed like a perfect rose. That chagrin, a losing a loved person. And you get this coming out time and time again in this remarkable set of poetry that is engraved on the Jewish tombstones. Um, and we, we'll look through them, Elena. As I said, they're very interesting. Again, icons, mother and child. And we can go through these quickly and appreciate them as we go. Here is the tombstone of David Raphael de Mercado. Important man. If we go back to him. Yes, thank you. Important man. He, among several others buried in this area, were all members of the Mahmud, members of the ruling junta of the Sephardic communities in Recife in Brazil. He and his father, Dr. Abraham de Mercado, wrote letters to Cromwell asking for permission to settle in Barbados. He is important. Why is he important? Because he came to Barbados at the introduction of the Sugar Revolution came bearing his knowledge from Brazil, and he invented a new type of sugar mill that was more efficient in grinding and processing sugar cane to help in the manufacture of wet sugar, muscovado sugar, for export to England. We can look at now a very interesting um, insight from another tomb. There's a tomb of a child. And I don't know if you can see this carefully. You have to look. I didn't want to use chalk and outline. I didn't want to commit that sacrilege. But this is the tombstone of a child. And why is this important? It is, to the best of my knowledge, the only one of two tombstones in the entire Jewish world, one in Odenkirk in Holland and one here in Barbados, that show the entire figure of God. You can see the figure there with the hatchet, the axe, cutting down the tree of life. And in the corner, again, part of the creolization aspect, a skull and crossbones signifying death. And here we'll, we'll have a look. Yeah, so this is the, the along the Carrera or row of young children buried this is the tomb of this unfortunate youngster who, who died an early death. Um, 
and we, we go on, Elena. Here's another important tombstone. This is a tombstone of Luis Diaz, Jesserun Mendez. Many of the early Sephardic Jewish members use dual names, uh, a Hebrew name and a more anglicized type name. So Jesserun Mendez was his um, Sephardic Jewish name and Luis Diaz was the name he used in everyday commerce, etc. And he is commemorated in his epitaph as in Portuguese there it says, Eli fundu Eshnoga do Nidhe Israel. He founded the synagogue of Nidhe Israel. So again, he is one of the members of the Brazilian Sephardic community who fled Brazil and moved to Barbados. And we can look at so many others again, interesting, but run through them a bit quickly. Um, death again. I have taken a number of Orthodox rabbis through the graveyard and they have balked at what they consider to be unnecessary um, iconography, an iconography that's a bit too secular, a bit too Christian for their taste. So here we have a skull, well sculpted macabre, but a skull in that garland of leaves, again representing the finality of life, death. We move on to another one, which is the skull and crossbones. A lot of people look and say, oh, these are tombs to pirates. Now there were Jewish, Jewish pirates, yes, but this is a standard iconography for death in the 17th century, the skull and crossbones. And we move on again. And here is the tomb of a rabbi, a Hazan, Meher, a Cohen, he was a member of the, the family of Cohen, who claimed direct descent from David, the house of David. That's why at the top, you see that Cohen, Cohen in blessing, the hands spread and signifying membership in the most aristocratic and most sacred of the, the, the family groups, the old Israeli or Israelite family groups going back to the, the times of Babylonia, the times of settlement in the Holy Land, etc. And at the bottom, again, very interesting iconography. There is Belafante blowing the ritual horn or the shofar in his mid 17th century outfit. He's a rabbi, hence he's a learned man. So if you look at that, you will see a hand with a quill indicating he's learned, he writes. And over to the, the right of the carving, you will see he was also a ritual circumciser, a mohel. So these are the surgical instruments used by the mohel to circumcise young Jewish male infants. Um, and again, you'd have to save it and zoom in on it, but around the, the stone is written in English. Then at the top, an inscription in Hebrew, usually an inscription from the Torah or something that had some mystical significance. And then the long epitaph in Ladino, in Portuguese or Spanish, and the blessing of the soul. And then again, a verse from the Torah in Hebrew. And we move on. Well, sorry, oh, these are some close ups. So, yes, there you see what I mean. Here is the Rabbi Meher, a coin belafante, blowing the chauffeur, chauffeur. And again, if we move on. Here is a tomb of a child, again, another child. 
of the angel Joseph Manuel, son of Aaron Nunez, who was taken to be collected by God Domingo, Sunday, on the date Menahem 5494, which translates to August 1731. And here we have the angel collecting of the soul with, no, I, I may be wrong. I have always interpreted this as being a creolized carving because I think that angel is holding a stalk of sugar cane, but I may be wrong. As I said, this may be wishful thinking on my part. It could very well be a, a bit of a palm tree, which, would, which I've also seen carved, local carvings done of coconut palms on tombstones in the Nidhe Israel Cemetery. And again, we see, uh, here is the, the uh, close-up of it. Yes, you can see how beautifully carved it is. And I mean, look at the date. So 1730, sorry, 1734. So this hasn't been affected by acid rain or the fungus that affects many of the tombstones in the cemetery. And it doesn't it look as if it were carved yesterday. So wonderful carving. And so you can have my, you can look at it on, on your own and tell me whether I'm right or wrong about that sugarcane thing. Now, now here is this. Again, look at this. Again, macabre. This is a tomb of a Jewish woman. And it shows a skull, a grinning skull, with a garland of flowers encompassed in that floral bouquet. And again, sending that message. What is life? Where does life end? It ends in death. But is death death? Or is it a new beginning? And the iconography often speaks to this. And we move on a bit. Now, this is interesting. Because in the 1860s, when the Sephardic community had dwindled, and where money was very scarce for the upkeep of the synagogue, they took in part of the old graveyard and decided through a covenant that they signed to build four shops which fronted on the synagogue lane and built the shops for commerce over an existing Jewish graveyard. Now, technically speaking, this is contrary to ritual. This is not halakhic. This is forbidden. So having gone through the minute books in London, and when I came across the covenant, I realized what was there. When I knew that work was going to be done on this part of the synagogue restoration, I pointed out to a number of people engaged in the restoration effort, uh, be careful taking up the wooden floor because underneath you're going to find graves. And I was told, no, there will be no graves because it's forbidden in Jewish law to build a commercial enterprise or any sort of enterprise on top of a, of a sacred Jewish graveyard. But here you see, this was done. And some of these graves are quite interesting. There's one in particular, if we can go on. Um, we we'll, another one, please. Ah, yes, here. Now, again, it's broken. But here is young David Nunez, 12 years old, on his deathbed. And the winged angel of death has come to claim him. Again, you get what I call a mise en scene, these artistic representations that are both poignant and charged with emotion, and which enable us to transcend time and space and go back and engage with the feelings of the parents of this young boy and the sadness and sorrow that they had to have felt when they lost their pride and joy at such a young age. And the epitaph itself speaks to that, their sense of loss, etc. Um, 
we move on a bit. And on the other side of synagogue lane, there's a small Jewish cemetery as well. Some of the graves were broken. Many of these broken tombstones resulted from the effects of the strong 1831 hurricane that caused so much destruction in the south of Barbados. And this is an interesting tombstone because it speaks to that. It's the young girl, Miss Jael Pinheiro, and it's, uh, well, I can't read it, but I know what the inscription is. The inscription identifies her place of residence, being in Fontabelle, and explains how she met her death. That on the morning of the hurricane, she was sheltering in a family home in Fontabelle, and the house was destroyed, and the fallen debris crushed her and killed her. So there we have that's again poignant tombstone to the death of, of Jael Hal Pinero. And so the graveyard as it is at present. And remember an earlier point I'd made about the difference, the cultural differences between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. Well, here in this graveyard, you can see what I mean. Sephardic tombs are flat, ledger type graveyard, grave tombs. And their iconography is pretty varied. Hand cut in the tree of life, skulls, fish, lambs, roses, floral tributes, the whole gamma. The Ashkenazim tombs are in the back. Raised tombstones, and their iconography is pretty specific, mostly the Star of David or the Seven Candelabra. Um, the the, the, the ritual kind of, I'm, I'm at a loss of word now. Uh, a senior moment has come menorah. about. The, the menorah, yes. I knew I was there, but it just wouldn't come out. My age is telling on me. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yeah, yes. See, that, that ritual kind of labra menorah or the Star of David. Yeah, so we, we move on a, a bit now. And move on a bit. And here in the synagogue museum are some of the beautiful, beautiful poems written celebrating the lives and the poignant verses referring. And I will see if I can remember one from memory. Some like going like, oh mortel, Oh, 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 mortal, quien pasa por aquí? Um, mirando. Mira, mira bien, porque no sabes la hora que llega cuando las olas van a mirar a su también. Oh, mortal, you are, who, like, translated roughly, it goes, you mortal who are walking by, looking at my grave, look well, because you don't know, but one day your turn will come when people too will pass this way and look at your tombstone. So reminding people that going to graveyards and look at the graves that are departed, life is transient. And one day we too will be buried. And one day we too will perhaps experience a feel or sensation of the living looking at us. And then others speak to the loss of wives loss of loved ones. Many Jewish women, Sephardic women, died young in childbirth. And this was because in a day and age, when you had a doctor or midwife attending a difficult birth, bleeding could not be controlled, or very often instruments were not sterilized properly, infections resulted, and Teenagers, wives married, but in their teenage years died. You, you see this repeated time and time again. There's an icon that I saw of a hand reaching out and grasping a rose and plucking it. And this was of a young wife 
And of course, the grieving husband would have specially commissioned that particular tombstone to represent his sense of loss and grief, etc. So uh, here is here's what I was speaking about, Dr. Abraham Nunez. For you who are looking at me look well, because you never know the hour when others will be looking at you too. Yeah. So we we can move on and, and now here is the synagogue depicted in the middle of the 18th century by the very famous Anglo Jewish historian Peter Harrison, who came to Barbados and worked on five projects, including the synagogue. And look at the fenestration, the number of windows, and the bottom floor, the fenestration, and the doorway. And we, we move on. Um, move on again. The traditional entrance, the shops. This is all part of the restoration. And yes, well, we, we come now to the areas of settlement. Now, this is not present day Bridgetown. This is a computerized um, reconstruction of Bridgetown as it was prior to the fire of 1764, when after that fire, the streets of Bridgetown were reconditioned, relayed out, reconfigured, a number of the lanes, the alleys, et cetera, were abandoned, closed off, and new roads built. So I, I wish I had a pointer uh, to show you all, but the main street of Jewish habitation, bear in mind that Bridgetown did not have an enclosed Jewish ghetto, okay? There were areas where there was a concentration of Jewish residents, but the Sephardim tended to be spread out in many areas of Bridgetown. So Swan Street, which was also called Jew Street, is there up to the top. And then you have Tudor Street, home to many Jewish families. Backchurch Street, again, home to many Jewish families. And Rachel's Alley, interesting name, because it was a Jewish family that lived on that street with a daughter called Rachel. Um, and Lauder's Alley, all of them going back down to what's called Backchurch Street, back in on what is today um, St. Mary's Churchyard, but on the map it's entitled Old Churchyard because in 1760, when this map is drawn to, to depict Bridgetown in 1760, there was no church there in the Old Churchyard. It had, it had been abandoned in 1660 when the wooden church was abandoned and St. Michael's Church was built on the other side of Bridgetown. Um, an interesting point that I would make, because in 1740, 1750, the hemispheres, not what I said, the hemispheres most important and most engaged internationally, black, black businessman, was a man called Joseph Rachel. And Joseph Rachel lived down here in Maiden's Lane. And who were, Joseph Rachel was the highest paying taxpayer. I got this from the levy books, which are a wonderful source of information for the inhabitants of Bridgetown. But I know that Joseph Rachel's neighbors were two Sephardic families and three poorer Christian families. So here you have this black man. He wasn't mixed. He wasn't a, a brown with the, with the 
with the, um, the privilege of colorism gave to, to, to mixed people, mixed race people back in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. He was a, he was a black man whose father was a slave who came up from absolutely nothing and who made himself the, I would say, the richest, most important, and most influential black businessman in the Americas. We, we, we go back though. So here are some examples of housing that Sephardic families might very well have lived in. This was a 17th century house. It was sadly demolished. I've excavated the, um, the foundation and it goes right back to the 17th century. I know this because I found a ceramic jar with the date 1664 engraved on it. Let's look at another um, slide. Um, here again, built in the Dutch style, again, the influence of the Dutch on Barbados. This is the oldest standing building in Bridgetown, built precisely at the point in time when the Sephardim were seeking refuge from Brazil and establishing residence settling in Barbados. This is Nichols building, built anywhere between 1650 and 1655. <clears throat> and in the early 19th century, the 1820s, 1830s, it was owned by a woman of mixed race who had a very Sephardic surname and a Sephardic name. And she was of the Da Costa family. She owned a structure and she rented it to a prominent white Barbadian, um, Robert Bolcher Clark, who was Solicitor General at the time. I hate to say this building is deteriorating and it needs serious tender love and care before we lose it. Next slide. And to the street, again, Sephardic families would have lived, operated businesses below and lived up top where from the verandas, they could have observed the street life going on um, below them. So this underscores the point I was making that people mistakenly think that the Sephardic community lived only in Swan Street and were restricted by some legal um, shenanigan to, to live in, in Swan Street alone. But this is simply not true. And by the early 19th century, the, the, the more prominent Jewish merchants had spread out and were occupying villas in what is today Fontabelle. The Daniels family lived there. The Montefiores, a name famous in Sephardic Jewish history, we have this Montefiore fountain in Barbados, and Montefiore is very prominent among English, the English, Spanish, Portuguese congregation. Um, we, we move on. And we, we move on to this portrait of an interesting young man. And this is where now I want to comment on the intersection of race and class and discrimination and the role that the Sephardic community played in all of this. This is a young man, Isaac Lopez Brandon. Now, his father is a prominent Sephardic merchant and plantation owner, one of the few Sephardic plantation owners, because generally, broadly speaking, the white planter class of Barbados did not want any competition in the 17th century from 
Jews who had come up to Barbados from Brazil with a knowledge of sugar planting, sugar growing, etc., and move to inhibit, if not prohibit, Jewish ownership of plantations. A few Jews did succeed in owning plantations. A few entered a subterfuge. You go, go to the deeds, and you can see where there is some arrangement made between a Christian and a Sephardic um, Jewish individual to behind the scenes, um, the, the Sephardic individual would, would put the funds necessary to buy the plantation. The, the Christian man would run the plantation and it was all done to the benefit of both parties to get away from the discriminatory legislation that inhibited um, Jewish participation in the plantation system. Another legal act passed to inhibit Jewish participation in the plantation system was an initial act limiting the number of slaves that Jews could own to one slave per person. It was later rescinded in the very early 18th century, but the intended purpose of the law was there. So back to this young man. Now, his grandmother was a slave of mixed race and the, the well, she's deemed to be a mulatto woman who was the slave of Hester um, Lopez. Anna Hester Lopez. Now, the Lopez's were very friendly with Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. And Deborah had a daughter, Esther Gill, and Esther had two children for Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, Isaac and Sarah. He looked after them. But the, the local Jewish community did not want to accept them as children of mixed blood, although very fair in appearance, as you can see, did not want to accept them into the Jewish um, community. In the, in, the, in the reform bill that was done and the, the, the rules established in 1824, it specifically states that no one of Negro extract can play a role or be admitted or be elected to serve on the Mahama or, or what was called the, the, the little anglicized we call the, the vestry that looked after the affairs. So, what did this young man do? He, he wanted to follow the faith of his father. And what he did was he went to Suriname, which was far more open and liberal and accepted non-whites into the Jewish congregation of Suriname. And he studied and he was admitted into the Jewish faith in Suriname. And he came back to Barbados and ultimately made his way to, to London where his father had them both educated, then it ended up in New York, and they are the subject of a marvelous book that's about to come out. If we can move forward, the, um, move forward again, let me see. Yeah, here. Yeah, this isn't published yet, but it is the story of this Barbadian family entitled Once We Were Slaves by my friend, Laura Liebman, The Extraordinary Journey of a Multiracial Jewish Family. And on the cover, if you look carefully, everybody, every Bajan, listen to me looking at this, would know that this is an old lithograph of Carlisle Bay set out here. And you're looking at the Garrison Bay Street and ships in Carlisle Bay, and you're looking down to Bridgetown on the other side. I'm very glad that Laura chose this to put on the cover of her book and on um, of it uh, as well, photographs of the, the Lopez Brandon family. They married well and they became pillars of New York Jewish society. So as I said, she makes a claim here, it was an extraordinary journey and it certainly was uh, an extraordinary journey. Now, if we can go back one, here is another individual that I wanted to 
to speak about. This is Nancy Daniels. Now, I know a fair amount about her. This is a photograph which was handed down and is still in the hands of the Barbadian family who are descended from the Sephardic Dazavedo family who bought her. She came to Barbados probably around 1756, around there, a very young girl, victim of the African slave trade. And she came to Barbados and was sold and bought by the Dazavedo family and later passed into the hands of the Daniels family, was manumitted, retained to serve them as a paid housekeeper and later on in life when she became too old they, they bought a house for her which was located not far from the synagogue and she lived there and they took care of her although she died now the family tradition that i got said that in the family tradition she lived to the ripe old age of 116 years and I thought, well, that was perhaps an exaggeration, but I found her death records in the archives and she is recorded as having lived to 112. And here she is, a pose photograph in a studio in Bridgetown, but Nancy Daniels, and what a life, what a life she, she would have lived. She lived through stirring times, remembering being captured, being sold in Africa, experiencing the trauma of the Middle Passage, arriving in Barbados, being taken, being either sold on board a vessel, which is where the majority of enslaved people were sold, or being taken to a yard of a business place and being sold in there. Contrary to popular opinion, Barbados had no central auction place where slaves were bought and sold. It's a mistake to think that where Trafalgar Square, where Nelson was put, was once the slave auction house, auction place of Barbados. This is simply not true. There was no central auction place of enslaved people being sold in Barbados. So Nancy Daniels saw all of that. She saw the 1816 slave revolt. She lived through the huge hurricane of 1831. She saw emancipation come. She lived through to see non-whites being admitted to the House of Assembly. She lived, as I said, through a huge change. She lived through periods of Franco-English war, the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, her memories must have been fantastic. And at this point in time, since we're talking about slavery and the slave trade, let me touch on a contentious point. Years ago, the Nation of Islam published a volume which accused Jews of being major slave traders. Now, there were Jewish slave traders in North America. The Gomez family immediately comes to mind. But I can't say this. Among the Sephardim, of Barbados. I have never encountered one single instance of any one member or any one Sephardic merchant ever taking part in or ever financing any aspect of the African slave trade. This was never done. Were the Sephardim owners of slaves? Yes, they were. And you can look at their wills and see. It's like a dual mentality at play here. You can see people being treated as chattel, being willed to children. On the other hand, you can see individuals, enslaved individuals being manumitted, being given pensions, being given homes, houses. As I said, it was like a jekyll and hide um, personality. And then sometimes, unfortunate beings, I came across a will of Isaac Lopez and his manservant, 
a chap by the name of King. He was like a, a faithful servant. He was enslaved, a faithful servant of uh, Isaac Lopez. Lopez, in his will, had him manumitted or made arrangements to have him manumitted. And everything was done and sealed as well. And then lo and behold, he wrote a codicil. He and King must have had some dramatic falling out. Because in his codicil, he says he rescinds his intention to manumit and free King. And in fact, his instructions were that King be sold for the highest price possible. And, and there you have it. So this was the fate of this man King. Far from being manumitted, he was sold. <clears throat> Again, and this is something that um, came up, an anomaly. In 1749, an English ship sailed in the Carlisle Bay. It had on board 19 young Portuguese. They were taken into Bridgetown and sold. They were Portuguese speaking. So who bought them? The Sephardic merchants who could speak Portuguese. And they bought them. I mean, I have, I have all the details, all the details here. Who bought them? Isaac de Pisa, Isaac Monsanto, Moses de Boab. Because what happened after several months, Governor Grenville discovered that these Christian citizens of His Majesty, the King of Portugal, had been brought to Barbados against their will and had been sold as slaves in Barbados. So he brought everybody up to Government House, the same Government House of today, Pilgrim, there in Pinell, and he brought the, the Sephardic merchants, he brought the Portuguese, he brought the English captain, he brought um, the Campos would serve as translator for the whole transactions, and he interviewed everybody. And it's all reproduced verbatim in the council minutes of the Council of Barbados, including what the, the, the Portuguese people felt. Um, Isaac Monsanto, for example, bought Isabel. What did Isabel have to say? Isabel said, oh, Mr. Monsanto treated her pretty good, but she wanted to be freed. She wanted to go back to her own country. Moses Abob brought, bought a um, woman called Polly, Portuguese, Portuguese woman. And the governor said, well, how do things go for you, Polly? Well, he complained and said, quote, well, um, I got along well with Mr. Bob. He treated me okay, but the mistress didn't. Uh, Mrs. Oberb treated me very badly. Well, <laughs> perhaps one can read between the lines. Maybe there was a little bit of jealousy there. Polly was perhaps young, beautiful looking. She was, what, 19, 20. Um, Mr. Bob may have treated her kindly, and Mrs. Bob, of course, would not have liked that. That's just my imagination at work there. But as, to cut a long story short, a boat was hired at the expense of the taxpayers of Barbados, and all the Portuguese put on board, including another woman, and because this is um, in the council minutes, since writing the above, another Portuguese woman has represented to me, the governor, that she was brought hither several years ago and sold and forced into a state of servitude and is desirous of returning to her native country. So the governor wrote a big letter of apology to Portugal apologizing for all of this and everybody was sent back to Portugal. It'd be marvelous to try to contact the families today and see if there was any memory of, of this whole sad episode in their, in their lives. Well, I want to hurry up because I know that time is going 
I'm waiting on Sir Paul to signal by cutting his throat that I'm running out of time. How much time do I have left, Paul? Carl, let me say that I think you have, you, you could go on forever. I, your, your stories are fascinating, but I, I think that according to the time that we have, you have exceeded the allotted time uh, significantly already. So I would ask just you to wind up, up if you could. Of the of failure to inform, but just from a time perspective. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to wrap up very, very quickly then. Very quickly. Let me fast forward to the, the 19th century. By then, the Sephardic community is dwindling. It goes on from, from a peak of perhaps 450 persons or perhaps 500, it dwindles down to 90, goes down 30, down to 18. And soon the community is practically non-existent. Tragedy occurs in 1831 when the synagogue is devastated by a hurricane and rebuilt. Now, the hurricane didn't destroy the synagogue. The roof was blown off. I get this from the minutes of the rebuilding community, but the walls were so weakened that the builders said, take everything down and build up from the existing foundation back up. So that was done. And at that point in time, the Sephardic community was dying. And, and it's sort of poignant to, to read the minute books and to, to read what the warden is saying. He said, he grieves when he looks around. There are times when he can't have a minion, the, the ritual number of 10 males to hold a service because there aren't enough people in, in the community to, to, to have this. And yet they built a synagogue to house 300 or 400 people. And he says, why? Why are we doing, why are we doing this? And he says, we're doing this because we live in hope that one day in the future, the Jewish community of Barbados will once again, like the Phoenix, rise from the ashes and we can fill our synagogue. But that did not happen. The last practicing Jew, the last observant Jew of Barbados, Mr. Baeza, realizing that the end had come, he sold the synagogue land and the synagogue with everything included to a Barbadian solicitor, uh, um, who, Mr. Yarwood, and Mr. Yarwood subsequently sold it to another solicitor, Hutchinson. There were plans to destroy, raise the graveyard, contrary to what Bevis Marks wanted. There was some litigation, etc., but it wasn't done. Thank goodness. And in my youth as a child, when I entered the synagogue with my aunt, of course, it was a business place. And the graveyard was overgrown, unkempt, and so on. Then 1930s. And the shadow war looms over Europe, the shadow of Nazism, the shadow of, of Hitler and the united pogroms that the Ashkenazim had to face over the centuries all coalesce and come together and, and the rightness on the wall for the Holocaust. And a number of families seek escape. You, you, you go through the, the wonderful memories um, coalesced by Simon Kreinle in his book entitled Peddlers, which is available for sale. And I myself have interviewed um, Rosa Allman and her search stories of survival and what happened to her family, tragic, all, all wiped out by the, by the Nazi troops, by the Gestapo, by imprisonment and, and death in the gas ovens of the Holocaust. Anybody who denies the Holocaust is a real idiot and doesn't know what they're talking about. Dreadful things happen. Nobody can look at the, 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 the numbers put on somebody's hand, a living person's hand of numbers of a concentration camp and not feel a sense of rage, a sense of 
My God is what humans did to each other, to line people up and put them in a gas chamber. So the Ashkenazim families, numbering some 40, established themselves in Barbados, established a synagogue of their own, the True Blue, um, Shad Sarah, um, in Rockley New Road, Golf Club New Road, and sort of resurrect the community. And fast forward then, this whole area, the, the, the whole area, the, the synagogue, everything is scheduled to be demolished. There are plans afoot to build a new law court, a new law center, and everything is going to be raised to the ground. And a group led by Sir Paul's grandfather and father, um, Sir Paul himself, Aaron Truss, and other members of the, of the Jewish community, the modern day Jewish community, approach Tom Adams and argue the point strongly and convince the prime minister that this will be a travesty to destroy the, the oldest son in synagogue in the, in the hemisphere and the, without a doubt, the oldest graveyard in the hemisphere. And so it was saved. And now things come full circle because thanks to the, the goodwill of a Jewish family, English Jewish family with, with, with Villa in Barbados and interests in Barbados and with the, with the interests of, the, of Nidhe Israel in mind, they have financed a marvelous restoration of the whole synagogue complex and have laid the groundwork actually have laid a seed for the regeneration of historic Bridgetown. I see it spreading out like a, a pebble thrown in a pond with the waves spreading out and moving in concentric circles. That whole sense area of restoration could go on because it's so promising and so feasible. And so in a way, what has happened in the last 10 years reflects the feelings of the Jewish community back in 1834, when faced with the pending dissolution of their community, they could look forward to a brighter future. And just as in today's Jewish community, of those 40 initial Ashkenazi families, they've dwindled to about 17 families today. You know, many of the, the youngsters no longer stay in Barbados. We, we export a lot of our brightest and best who see greener pastures, and, and I'm not blaming them. Horizons in Barbados are limited. Everybody can't be a leader. Everybody can have a wonderful top paying job. Horizons are limited. And so people will seek avenues of opportunity overseas. So this has resulted in a dwindling of the present Ashkenazim community. But we look forward, as I said, the community did in 1834 to a, a resurrection. Um, again, the proverbial Phoenix rising from the ashes and to a new and brighter future. And I will draw to close there. Look, there's so much, so much research, so much documentation, so many tales, so many stories to be told. I can have you all here, captive prisoners from now on tomorrow. But I, I will now, I think, entertain perhaps a few questions, if I may. I believe that Elena is going to field some questions. She would have had some that were written in. And if I would ask her to, to pose those questions to you, Carl. Yes. Um, I have to mute somehow. I have to mute something. Do I? I'm just... <laughs> okay, um, the first question comes from Sandra Shapiro, and she asks, please describe the second synagogue in Barbados. What is known about it? One second. Uh, thank you for that, you see. I, I neglected to, and I have it all down here in my notes. 
apart from Nidhe Israel, a smaller group of the Sephardic community moved north to Spikestone. And they established a small synagogue in Spikestone. There were no more than perhaps um, 100 um, members of the Sephardic community in Spikestone. Now, we don't know exactly, I have an idea where it was located because sadly in the 1730s, there was a riot that resulted in the destruction of the Spike Sun Synagogue. Um, it, uh, there was a wedding, some Christians had been invited to a Sephardic wedding. A couple of them got drunk, they slept off the wine, etc., in a Sephardic home. Apparently there was some pilfering of jewelry and so on. And they were accused and there were some blows shared. And as a result, the Gentiles, the, the Christians of Spite Stone got together and said, oh, you, you're beating up Christians? Well, we're gonna turn around and we're gonna exact revenge. And so a Christian mob rioted and tore down the, the synagogue in Spite Stone. But I think it was somewhere on Church Street to the north, bordering on what was called the Old South Pond. And I get this from reading the will of Rachel Mendez, who indicates boundaries for the synagogue. That's okay, and our next question comes from Donna on Facebook. She asks, uh, she says some grids are missing. Are records set? in England? Yeah, when you say um, some graves are missing, bear this in mind. You, you're referring to the cemetery of Nidhe Israel. There are a couple of things going on here. Some of the graves were covered when that road was built by Mitch, Mr. Hutchinson to allow vehicles to go through to the decommissioned synagogue. Then walls have been constructed on existing graves. Then a number of gravestones were destroyed in the 1831 hurricane. So yes, any, any records that were sent up to London, which are housed now in the London Metropolitan Archives, there are burial records, death records, and records of the roads that well, are called carreras, which were sold or, or leased or given to families, we buried in family units. But also a point that I should have made, which I neglected to make, the existence of Sephardic records only begin in 1760. The earlier records seem to have gone lost. And I think I understand why there was a falling out with Agabe. He was asked to return the records, early records that he had. He never did. Whether they were destroyed or whether they were waiting to be found, we don't know. So those early records are incomplete. And they can only be filled out by referring to the English records held in London or the Dutch Sephardic records held in Amsterdam or records held in Suriname or in Curacao or perhaps even in Jamaica. So it's a lot of retrieval that has to be done. <clears throat> I've gone on to Suriname to look at some of the records but in, in London, I wasn't able to, to look at the English records of Bevis Marks because it was so engaged in retrieving the existing records of Need Israel. I'll have to go back to London um, to look then at the English records to flesh out um, what we don't know from the first part of the Sephardic century. So yes, um, there is still work to be done and there are a lot of gaps. Hopefully they can be filled. I don't know.
Okay, our next question comes from Alice and Tony who says, how long did the war of attrition last? Now, when you say the war of attrition, um, I am I'm a bit lost there. What what specifically are you referring to? Because honestly, there were many many wars of attrition. You can look at all the pogroms that occurred in in Europe from medieval times up as wars of attrition. You can look at the whole period of the Reconquista as wars of attrition. You can look at what happened in, in Brazil as, as wars of attrition. You can, you can go back to Roman times, Babylonian times. Jews have over the millennia faced many wars of attrition. Okay, um, we have a question from David Gibbs on Facebook. He asks, how do the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian Barbados today? As a complete outsider, being neither Jewish nor Muslim, I can only say from looking on and from my interactions, both with Muslims and with Barbadian Jews, I, I would say that there is engagement. I, I would not, we live in trouble times, let's that's, that's, that's recognize this far. But I, I, I would say, and I don't know if Sir Paul can comment that the relationships are mutually engaging, mutually cordial. We are, first of all, I, I would say, Barbadian, despite our religious differences, etc. And I think both Christians and Muslims must recognize that Judaism, to some degree, is the bedrock of both Christianity and Islam. And in Islam, the prophets of the Old Testament, the prophets of the Torah are recognized as such, just as Christians have a Bible that encompasses the Old Testament and the New Testament, and if I go back in historical times to what I was saying earlier about Spain, in Spain, the Sephardim played an absolutely necessary and, and important role for both the Islamic caliphates and for the Christian kingdoms because of their specific background, educational background, expert expertise, knowledge base, all of these things. Um, so back to your question, subject to any correction by anyone else, and as I said, Sir Paul is here, I, I would <clears throat> say that the relationships are, are cordial and, and mutually beneficial within their own spheres of belief and religious belief. There is tolerance. Yeah. Maybe, uh... Carl, if I could just add that just over a year ago, there was a meeting of the Abrahamic faiths, which was the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, and there was even included in that the Rastafarians. And that was quite an event, which ended up at Codrington College over several days, where there was a discussion between the faiths and a, 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 a melding of thoughts and the, the words of, of understanding that were spoken at that conference were very warm and cordial and in my opinion exhibited the
camaraderie, the comfort that exists in Barbados between all religions. And uh, maybe that's the best way that I could explain it. Thank you, Paul. Well said. We have time for one more question, and um, this comes from Mark Miller. Do you know anything about the blood link between the following men and the 1831 worshiping Jews in Barbados? Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, who owned 191 and named at Fort St. Michael in 1832. John Barrow, who owned 241 at Upton, Sunbury, and Hampton. Thomas Daniel, who owned 198 at Lowers. Just among a few people with obvious Jewish, Jewish names. 1817 to 34, who owned enslaved Barbados? Yeah, interesting question. And yes, in fact, in my talk, I did point out the relationship between Abraham Rodriguez Brandon and his children, um, Isaac and Sarah Lopez Brandon, and their history that's soon going to be revealed in that book by Laura Liebman. <clears throat> Let me say this, because it was at sub it's room and um, the subject of a, of a separate topic in its own right. But in that chapter that Sir Paul cited in, in the book, The Jews of the Caribbean, that chapter that I wrote, chapter 11, I looked in detail at the numerous, what I call afro sephardic families of the times and of Barbados. And they are, although the, the Sephardic community, a discrete Sephardic community has come to an end, there are thousands of Barbadians of all complexions who can trace their descent back to Sephardic families. All you have to do is look in the Barbados telephone directory and from the name above, right through all the Dacosas, the Pises, Carvalho's, Lopez's, Lindo's, Lobo's, Pinero's, you name it, Castello's, they're all, all there. And Increasingly, people are doing their DNA and discovering that in their DNA, they do have some percentages and links that go back to Southern Spain. What are these? These are the Sephardic links that are coming out and manifesting themselves. I know of several Barbadian families. Oh, one example. Our first prime minister, Harold Barrow, who established and he descended from the Baruch family who changed her name, anglicized it to Barrow. I, I know of Barbadians who, whose family surnames today are not Sephardic, but who can claim direct descent from the Dazavedos, the Depazes. On and on it goes. I have been engaged in recent years in trying to locate as many descendants as I can of the old Sephardic families. And I'm astounded not at how few they are, but the reverse, how many they are. Helena, I, I, I take it that was your last uh, question? Well, there are still a few around, but I'm thinking that it's probably time that we wrap up now. Okay, but let me start by, by thanking you for your part here this evening. But of course, all of the acclaim or almost all of the acclaim has to go to our presenter, uh, Dr. Watson. Carl is as I said, a friend, but he's more than anything else, he's a treasure. He's a, a, a sort of a, a source of infinite study and records of, of, of Barbados in general. Tonight, of course, we heard of the 
the, the Judaism in Barbados from the 17th century, which he took into today's time. But his, his knowledge uh, uh, that he shared with us tonight was simply astounding. Um, it's one that he, he, never, he never can get tired repeating, but he's never gets enough time to really expand on sufficiently. Of course, he has written on it and the writings that, and the articles that, uh, that Carl has, uh, uh, has prepared uh, are there for everyone to, to review and to research. So the story of the Sephardic uh, movement and the ones that are more uh, prevalent today, the Ashkenazis, is one that we can go on and tell and continue to talk about. Uh, the, his ability to, to explain how that all ended up with the settlement in Barbados and the uh, introduction of sugar, uh, the role of, in, in trade and the, and the Dutch presence here, the uh, ability to be given the, the, the uh, right to vote in Barbados before they received it in England, which I don't know if uh, Carl mentioned, which was uh, given by Oliver Cromwell. And of course, the full story that, that was told here tonight will be captured and in, in the uh, museum that we have on the site of the synagogue, there is a oral history room, which we have several uh, recordings and I, uh, spoke to Carl about having this, uh, this lecture and some other uh, expanded uh, uh, information that he would like to present to be kept in that oral history room. So I, I want to thank Carl, I want to thank the audience, I want to thank uh, the museum, uh, the university for, being, for playing their part in, in tonight's lecture. I think it was fascinating, I think anyone uh, who attended and was a part of the uh, Zoom uh, meeting would uh, all attest to that. And I want to thank those who uh, did take the time to, to be a part of it uh, for, for doing so. Um, and my final uh, duty, if I may say this evening, is uh, to invite the audience from tonight and any further audience to return for the next lecture week on the topic Emancipa emancipatory uh, religions, Quakers, Methodism, Moravianism in pre-emancipation Barbados. And that lecture will be given by Mr. Akiri Adams. Uh, so again, thank you all and good night. <laughs>